Good evening. Good evening. Uh, overwhelming ex excitement in the room. <laughs> You're just too much to handle. Um, this is, I don't know what the right word is, it's, I think it, the best way to describe it is, it is as a workshop in the sense that I've got a basic structure to work through in terms of what I might suppose we might call a, sort of a quality assurance with regard to your dissertation. You know, basic checks, is it working? But I'm equally concerned that it's, we can use it as a sort of um, a, a problem solving approach, you can raise I I issues from your own experience. I can't always guarantee to give you an authoritative response because that's really got to come from your supervisor. But nevertheless, let's use each other as a resource please in the course of the session in order to increase confidence that you are in control. Because these things tend to have a life of their own, do they not? And they can run away with you and, and so on. You know, my worst experience was somebody in one university, the, the master's dissertation was 15 to 17 and a half thousand words and she presented me with 32,000 and said, um, will it do? And I said, no. And, um, and then she said, I, I said, you've got to cut hard. And she said, but it's my baby. You know, thought, oh Lord, how do I respond to this? Um, it, 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 you will find, I'm sure you have, that sometimes there's just not enough space or time left to do your topic justice. Um, so we need to have it under control. We need to make sure that you do the, um, you know, being pragmatic, you, you keep the focus right on what has to be done, but also hopefully you enjoy the experience of actually engaging with it. So at any time, stop me and question and raise points. Because we're filming this, uh, the Oscars were last night and we just missed out sadly, but um, I'm sure some of you will get best supporting roles. Uh, uh, sorry. But unfortunately, my body double, um, Johnny Depp, wasn't available for this evening. Um, but basically, if you ask a question or raise a comment, then I will rephrase it back so that we can capture it on the movie. Okay, so this is Dissertation Management, the movie. It, uh, it, uh, the, 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 the films that won last night have nothing on compared to what we're going through. And I was trying to think of a way in to really capture what I see as the key issues around this notion of you know, really developing a piece of research. And I suppose that one way of understanding it, and this isn't on the handout because I've just made this up, but is the essence essentially that of a really effective piece of research, I think, is the interaction between theory and practice. You know, that's the thing that really does make the difference. And I think some people are very good at writing about the theory and some are very good indeed at writing about the practice. But it's when you get the interaction going that we get really high quality work. And that's where the scholarship comes in, I think. And so what I would suggest to you all the way through your review of how you're structuring and organizing your writing, how you're actually putting it forward, is to think to what extent does this part of my research show the interaction between theory and practice and crucially between practice and theory. Yeah, because if we're doing a professional qualification then all the way through there is this notion there's the academic and there's the professional. And that keeping that balance right is absolutely fundamental. And that at the heart of that, I think, is allowing your the theoretical constructs and, and, uh, and um, conceptual um, maps to, to inform you the practice that you've investigated and vice versa. So there's a real issue, I think, of saying, is this an interaction of the theory and the practice? The balance will vary enormously according to your topic. I can't give you a nice, neat formula for that. But the overarching issue, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is the notion that this is the completed document is evidence that you have been thinking both about the conceptual and, and about the practical. You know, and, and because that's the difference, that's what makes it a master's degree as opposed to a piece of professional writing and so on. Is that reasonably coherent as a starting point? And the other th way of thinking about this, and again, ap apologies for lack of a, a diagram, but if you think of a, a, a classic Venn diagram, the three circles, then I think the quality of your dissertation is determined by the interaction between the three circles, one of which is the academic. And the criteria for assessing your work are, are, are academic criteria, quite properly, because this is leading to the award of a qualification. But then there's the professional, and you are all practitioners, and therefore the professional dimension has enormous significance. And then there's what we might call scholarship 
which is very difficult to pin down and define. But I think for me, it's the integrity with which you are working and matching the other two. In other words, does this make sense? Is, is it an authentic piece of, of research? Is it an effective piece of writing? So therefore, don't be frightened about saying this piece of theory is contradicted by this example of practice and vice versa. And please bear in mind that it needs to, you know, your dissertation has several masters, if you like, of which the academic um, excellence is a crucial one, the professional relevance is a crucial one, but underpinning both of those is scholarship. Just the way you write, the way you actually engage with the ideas. Is that making sense? Is that okay? Anything at this stage or we're too early in our relationship, are we? Fine, okay. Oh, the other point that we should have mentioned, of course, is that um, this, pro th this um, session is timetabled from, s from 6 until 7.30. Um, I will not be here at 7.30. Okay, about 7.15, we think about 7.20. So you know, keep your eye on the clock, because if you've got a question to ask and it's getting towards the end, then you may not get a full answer. So let's now use the handout as a structure for exploring issues and really... Um, beginning to elaborate what they might mean in practice and how you do this of course is very much your approach. I see this as some sort of, 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 of review checklist and that you need this almost as a way of saying right everything's in place um, and it sounds a bit mechanistic I know but there's a really interesting book published a couple of years ago now called The Book of Checklists which sounds just about the most boring book ever written doesn't it? It was written by an American surgeon called Atul Gawande and he noticed that on some fairly basic routine operations there was a, a significant number of unexpected deaths and he began to investigate why, good piece of empirical research, and what he found was that usually these unexpected deaths were the result not of malpractice or incompetence but simply people forgetting to do things. So he introduced this notion of a checklist, which has now been taken up by the World Health Organization, and it has 19 elements. And the first seven are before the patient goes into the operating theater. Who is this person, and which leg are, are we removing? That sort of thing. Then before the operation actually starts in the theater, the, the, the revisiting and the checking again, and then a further seven after the operation just to make sure that everything's been done properly. And that basic procedure has led to a 30% reduction in unanticipated death. Really interesting, you know, that the notion is that if you're really going to be confident about your dissertation, then you really need something like this in order to be absolutely confident that you have covered all the components. I'm not saying this list is definitive, but hopefully it moves in that direction. The other interesting thing that he actually picks up in the book is, um, remember a few years ago now, there was that, the aircraft that crashed after takeoff in New York and landed in the Hudson River. And you can see it on YouTube, actually. It's one of the most popular things on YouTube. And the pilot is an amazing guy. And he talks about the way that the, he, he saved... I don't think a single person died. I don't think virtually nobody was injured in the crash. And basically he said that he had about 30 seconds because it was, it was a virtually unique experience of a, a, a double multiple bird strike. So about 30 seconds after takeoff, complete loss of power. If you're planning to fly in the next few days, I do apologize for this. And he said the basic protocols kicked in instantly. And then having got things under control, he was then able to be creative and make sure the aircraft came down safely. And I think that's a really powerful way of thinking about the way that you manage your work, is that you need to have the confidence that the basics are in place. But then, if I got those right, you can then have the confidence to go on and do things which are interesting, exciting and different. Yeah. One of the great shots of that aircraft on YouTube shows um, some people, st you know, those big rafts they have, the big slides that turn into rafts. Lots of people standing on those, and then some people standing on the wing up to their waist in water. The people in the raft who are dry were business class. The people on the wing up to their waist in water in midwinter were economy. 
So it's always worth saving up to fly business, ladies and gentlemen. It, you just get a better class of disaster. Yeah. Right, so the argument is essentially do not neglect on the basic, you know, as I say, the quality assurance issue. Get it right. And that's why the first point on the review is this notion of the presentation of your project. And I can't stress to you, and it's over and over and over again, and we've all done it, but basically, you, know, you finish a piece of work, you, you set it off to be bound, or you set it off to be published, and you have a look at it when it comes back, and the first thing you spot is a typo. You know, life is like that sometimes, isn't it? And therefore, you know, first of all, the use of computer systems has enormously reduced the basic errors. But it's amazing, even at a very sophisticated level, for example, how sometimes in the middle of somebody's dissertation there's a change of font size. Usually done by the machine itself, not by you. You know, let's, let's be quite clear. That sometimes, for example, the ultimate is you've got this lovely quotation and you can't find where it came from. Yeah? And you spend a week hunting for that elusive page number and eventually, of course, you make it up. But... <laughs> That's not to be recorded, that last comment. But the notion is, you see, that all of those things are part of the scholarly component of, um, um, of your research. You know, the clarity of presentation, the accuracy with which your, the, your dissertation is presented, and crucially, the consistency are right the way across. And this is just basic good housekeeping, isn't it? But if the notion is essentially that this has an enormous impact upon the credibility of your research. And I can't stress that strongly enough. You know, if it looks right, it ch the chances are it is right. And therefore, investing time and even buying a friend, a colleague, a large bottle of wine in order to say, please go through this with a fine tooth comb, I can't, you know, it's a very, very necessary component. If you've been cutting and pasting, sometimes we forget to go back and sort out the mess that we'll be cut and pasted from, yes? There are all sorts of simple, trivial things which on the one hand are so routine it's almost embarrassing to mention them, but on the other hand really do make the difference in terms of scholarship. And I suppose the bottom line, the absolute bottom line on this is internal consistency. If you adopt a certain method of, of referencing, please do it right the way through. If you find that y y y you know, th the way that you present uh, any tables or diagrams or whatever, is it all consistent all the way through? That's the professional bit. That's the bit that makes it look good and gives it status. Any observations on that? Any comments? I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's very basic, and I apologise, but actually you'll be amazed how... I mean, last year I, I was examining a PhD, and there were several parts of it where it had just lost control, you know, that it wasn't coherent, and immediately you, 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 you turn against it. So it's important. You know, do your thinking justice by having really coherent, systematic approach to your presentation and organisation. Yeah, all clear? Any thoughts? Any comments? Okay, let's just take a moment or two, and welcome to those of you who've just arrived. And just with your neighbour, please, just say, to what extent are you in control of your text, please? And those of you who've just arrived, if you'd like to grab a quick cup of tea in the bun, there's some over there. Just two minutes, quick conversation. Are you in control? Are you managing your text, etc., etc.? So, as I say, sorry to, to start with the basics, and I hope it's, it's, it's not insulting, but believe me, over and over again, when it comes down to marking these things, the mistakes come through. And it's just, it just diminishes the quality of your thinking if it is not given appropriate um, quality in terms of presentation and so on. Now, number two is simply, uh, and it, uh, again, regulations vary, but for most purposes, any kind of dissertation or thesis does require some sort of abstract. And I don't know what yeah. the regulations are. Is it, 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 so it, it, uh, there, you see. Uh, so think of that as a precy, mm. essentially, and it's a real piece of intellectual skill mm. to, to to actually compress your dissertation into 200 words is really tight, and yet it's one of those key factors because that's how your work will be known. And so it's worth putting in a lot of effort into that and really working and shaping it and shaping it and shaping it because it is one of those indicators that this is an example of somebody who's been scholarly in their approach. 
and really summarize it. And essentially, if you think about it, 200 words is what, about, what, 20 lines, something like that? So half a page? And, and it's up to you, it depends on the nature of your study, but nevertheless, you need to indicate certain key components in your abstract so that the reader can say this is worth following up or not. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think it's one of the great sadnesses that the art of the precy has virtually disappeared from the world of education. But in fact, your, your abstract needs to be a quality precy which provides signposts of the key elements of your dissertation. And, and I suppose, to put it crudely, you need a sentence saying what it's about. You need a sentence to say how you did it. You need a sentence to say what your key findings were, and you need a sentence to say what your conclusions are. Something like that, Mary, would you say? Indeed, I would. Yeah. We would say single-spaced and indented as well. Yes. The words, would say that. Yeah. Oh, it's the key words is important, isn't it? Yes. The words are really important. Yeah. I think the discipline, actually, of identifying them helps. Yes, anyway. absolutely. And you see, all that you're doing there is what every piece of published research in the world can, has to conform to. You will not get into a journal, you will not get into any significant ap academic publication without identifying keywords and having a, an abstract which really synthesizes what your, your piece of work is about. It's a good discipline, really is. Any comments? Anybody done it? Anybody have heartbreaking stories about how long you've slaved over those 200 words? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah, right. First of all, what's it about? In other words, you need to say what the broad area of your study is in the sense of this is an investigation into changing classroom practice, for example. Secondly, you need to say what, how did you carry out your research? This is a case study of blah, blah, blah. Or this is based upon the, um, the journals kept by teachers of their experience of working on a change of strategy. Something like that, which gives a, a, an overview of the methodology that you've adopted. Thirdly, what does your study show? Yeah. So we found that the majority of teachers were totally confused, which bewildered and bewildered and had given up. Or something like that. You know, it's just a, one of those positive outcomes. And then, fourthly, what, you know, where does this take you? What are the conclusions? What are the implications? This study has demonstrated that, for example, a lot of the work that's going on at the moment on, on classroom-based research, we say this study confirms the overall um, proposition made by David Hargreaves in his study for the National College that classroom-based research is a powerful tool in school improvement. Happy with that? Yeah, thanks. So it's something on those lines which simply gives the snapshot. But and in, in, in doing what I've just done, I've probably, I'm, I'm not very far off 200 words. But you do need to be careful because it's, it's part of the discipline of presenting your, your dissertation. Okay, right. Now, the next two are again, and if I sound um, obvious, then I, I do apologise. But... <coughs> Is the purpose clear? Is the title accurate? So important. Now you know the cliche, that with any piece of research the last thing you write is the title. In other words, because the title has got to be a descriptor of what follows. And sometimes these things do take on a life of their own, don't they? So you need to actually say, this is my study, because one of the part of the process of assessing very complex pieces of work like your dissertations is to say to what extent does the dissertation substantively respond to the issues identified in the title. So if you say a study of changing practice in classroom teaching then that had better be the leitmotif right the way through your study. Because if you go off on a different tangent then being absolutely brutal, one could say, this study's failed because it does not reflect the intentions in the title. And that sounds so obvious, it's embarrassing, but actually it does happen. So make sure that your title is absolutely clear. And also, what's the purpose of your study? Why are you doing it? 
Is it, to f is it to investigate a school improvement strategy? Is it to evaluate a CPD project? Is it, you know, is it, is it, is it, is it? And sometimes it's quite a useful idea to have a short, the main title, colon, and then a slightly longer subtitle, like they do with many books. You know, a study of, an investigation of. But nevertheless, the project, you know, the purpose of your project needs to be robust up front and almost to the point of that your first sentence is the purpose of this study is to. And that's, no, that's not a bad thing to do at all. And then we come on to the issue of context. And th this is a courtesy to the reader, essentially. But it's also a very important way of mapping out your territory and saying this is a study of um, developing the use of, um, of, of feedback in assessment in a small primary school. Because that's totally different to the use of feedback in assessment in a large secondary school for all sorts of reasons. So you need to be very clear about the context and you also need to recognise the variables that are in place. Yeah that what are, what are the significant variables that determine the way in which you carried out your research. You know, this is a school that has been outstanding for several years but it has recently been, become good. Therefore, there's a fair degree of paranoia about and my research was compromised by nobody who been wanted, been willing to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, you know, things like that are, are valid. Explain so the reader understands the areas in which are significant in influencing the way that your project went. Yeah, okay on that one? And then here comes the first really, really big one. The central issue, problem or topic. In other words, you are investigating, you are researching, therefore by definition you are problem solving. And you need to, th to think of it about, right, there's the big field of saying effective teaching and learning and how do we reduce that down, reduce that down, reduce that down and make sure that we really are focusing in. A colleague of mine years ago used to say that the three golden rules of the effective dissertation are firstly focus, okay got that one, secondly focus <laughs> and some of you may be just anticipating me at the moment, a thirdly focus. In other words you cannot, you need to drill it down because often one of the weaknesses of dissertations is they attempt to be too big, too broad and lack clarity and focus. And therefore don't try and take on the entire issue of the quality of pedagogy in your school. Focus in on a particular dimension of pedagogy which is under your control. And, the, and make sure that when you write up your, your, your dissertation that you really are consistently following through that particular focus. Yeah. Now, the practice varies, and I, I wouldn't want to um, undermine anything said to you by supervisors. I personally think that research questions are a very good idea. I think they give you clarity and focus, and also they do help you to, at the end of your study, say, I started out with these questions and here are my answers to them. It's a very good way of, sort of bringing a full circle. I would suggest to you that the big research question, the overarching research question, is actually your title. You know, your title turned into a question, if you follow me. And then there are the subordinate research questions, which are essentially the, the, the chapters or the sections in your study. Yeah, so for example, here's my big title, which is investigating um, classroom practice. So the first um, subordinate question is, what is the conceptual background that I'm going to employ? You know, what does the theory tell us? Then there's an issue about methodology, then there's an issue about uh, um, interpreting results, then there's an issue about conclusions to be drawn. Yeah, and I think that in your introduction it's worth saying these are the key questions that I am going to use this study in order to uh, um, you know, increase my understanding or however you define the outcome that you're looking for. Are you comfortable with that? Is that okay? Or you're all doing this, I can see from the, the notes that you're writing down. It's absolutely second nature to you. All right?
and I'll pause there for a minute just to give you a, a rest from my voice and just say with your neighbour and if you have a choice pick the right one please <laughs> yeah so far how confident are you are you in control is everything going to plan but because the middle column on the handout yes this is okay therefore response or sorry action no action required or saying actually I think I need to go back and just recheck the referencing I need to go back and really work through the extent to which the questions that I'm asking are clear and part of etc etc just have a couple of minutes please question your neighbor are you confident about the dimensions that we've looked at so far okay and of course there's plenty more tea and coffee and buns still available any thoughts any observations any comments at this stage yes ma'am I mean, and my own personal view is that it's, uh, it's very plastic. The, sorry, the question was, how much can you change your research questions at this late stage of the process? And I think the answer is that it, as long as the changes are firstly um, accounted for and saying, look, because of this particular finding, I need to re rethink my approach. I think that's actually very powerful. I, I always welcome that when I, you know, somebody's consciously managing their research rather than simply going through and, and writing everything up. So I mean, it's a bit like you know, the best school improvement plans are made up of, of post-its and, and rubbings out and so on. They're not pristine documents. The best piece of research says, I tried this, it didn't work, so I've changed. I couldn't get hold of this data, so therefore I've had to rethink this question. I think that's fine, because as long as you're actually describing to the reader why, why you are where you are, then I think the process is almost continuous. And in many ways, you draw your conclusion and say, I didn't quite achieve what I wanted, but on the way I have found the following useful thing. And I think that again, uh, um, I regard as being uh, um, uh, uh, as being professionally valid, you know, because you're saying we don't always control these things. You know, people, you know, things change. You know, you're the, the people who agreed to be interviewed suddenly change their minds. So therefore, it's a living thing. It's a breathing thing. And as long as you are consciously um, responding to the environment in which your research is taking place and, and, and analysing your responses to that, I think that's great. Are you happy with that? Very much so, and now at this stage of having written an interim report, I think it's, it's, it's the rule rather than the exception, probably, that the, major, the majority of people anyway, that there's tweaking to be done, mm -hmm. if nothing more to the question, so you know, I would encourage that very close scrutiny of the question between now and submitting the dissertation, because you will probably not have quite answered the question you set out to. Yeah, exactly. Even if you just need to focus that slightly. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you, May. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful of you. Thank you. Right, let's move on. Now, again, personal prejudice, but if I'm marking whether it's a master's dissertation or a doctorate, I tend to read the literature review first. Simply because I think that's where you find the extent to which there's real scholarship. That's when the academic rigour begins to, to demonstrate itself. And in essence, the literature review, it may be very small, it may be very substantial, it depends upon your topic. But I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's in the literature, your engagement with the literature, that you begin to assemble the concepts that are going to inform your actual investigation. And you need to do the literature review in order to establish your own conceptual framework. Yeah? And, and Mary and I were just saying that the nightmare is when somebody's doing some research and they come up to you and say, I've got my data, now I'm going to do my literature review. Wrong way round. You cannot gather your data unless you have reviewed the prevailing existing literature because the way that you investigate, the way that you interrogate the particular area, the questions that you ask in your questionnaires, the, the issues that you raise in your interviews have to be logically and clearly and explicitly derived from your analysis of the data. Can I make it any clearer or stronger than that? You know, the thing is that every question that you ask must have a pedigree. Yeah, does that make sense? 
You know, that you must be able to say, in reading um, A and B and C, they all three propose the following components of this particular approach. By synthesizing A, B and C, I've come up with my own model, which I'm then now going to use in order to inform the design of my research method. Yes, with me? But you need to make it explicit. And so what I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, and here's something where you can go back and check, and say, right, has my literature review got, if you like, a clear logic to it, which culminates in my definition? Let me give you one example, which is, it actually cropped up, I was doing some teaching over the weekend, and there was a fairly fierce debate on Sunday morning around how, to, if we're talking about um, strategies to support um, pupil learning in the classroom, then one of the best there is, according to all the evidence we have, is co-coaching, yeah? And that, that, that led to a big debate about what's the difference between coaching and mentoring. Now then, w countries have gone to war over this, and there's a whole theology around the difference between mentoring and coaching, which I won't burden you with tonight. But the, the notion is there are multiple interpretations, most of which are wrong. I, I'll tell you the correct answer later if you'd like to know. But you, what you have to do is to say, for the purposes of this study, I am following X and Y and Z who argue that coaching has the following characteristics. I'm aware that A and B and C actually say something different, but I found that W actually makes sense and therefore I'm following it. Does that work? And so what you're doing is using the different sources to build up your own conceptual framework, your conceptual model, which is saying that you know, coaching in the classroom is undoubtedly a highly significant um, pedagogic strategy. But we need to define it. So go back over your literature review and say, have I defined clear uh, yeah, sorry, have I provided sharp, clear definitions of key concepts? In this study, X means this. And I'm aware that it could have other meanings, but I'm saying it means this for my purposes now. And that actually really does demonstrate the scholarship aspect. You are taking on the writers, the theorists, and saying, this is how I'm going to use them, and this is how they fit. And then, having defined what the key concepts mean, you can then go into the evidence base and say this is what it looks like. And so, for example, if we were looking at co-coaching, then the work of John Hattie would obviously kick in as a significant factor. You would look at the work of, of, um, of Bloom, you know, he of the taxonomy, he did a lot of work on coaching and effective learning. And basically you would build up a case saying it does seem to be the case that with regard to Hattie and Bloom and the work done by the University of Durham on the pupil premium that co-coaching is a very, very potent strategy which has the following advantages and the following um, disadvantages. And suddenly you're building up this rich picture of the key conceptual framework of, of your study. Do you recognise that? Is that clear for everybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. So, yeah. I know, presumably, you may say it's subject to the topic that yeah. everyone's doing, depending on how much literature exists for yeah. <laughs> obviously, there, there's yeah. my specific topic. I'm looking at ethnic minority groups. Yeah. And so the literature is quite vast. Absolutely. Um, but I chose to focus on four and, and, and did quite detailed literature review of those four. Yep. Um, as opposed to looking at uh, the wide range. Mm. I think the point you've raised is really important. Thank you. The notion is there is no measurement. You know, it's how long is a piece of string, or how many books do I read? You, know, you can't answer that. It's partly driven by, as you indicate, the notion of does this particular topic have a historical literature? And if it does, you need to be aware of that. But it, you know, the decision to say there are four pivotal texts, I think is fine, as long as you acknowledge 
that there are uh, that you are uh, you're focusing in on these four texts because bang 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 and that I'm aware that there are these other texts but they are not as relevant or they are using a different methodology or they've been discredited or whatever and so you are making sure that your choice of texts is justified that's the first point and secondly that you are able to defend it against a charge that you haven't dealt with so and so and so and so yeah that's great Th thank you for raising that very much yes ma'am Sentence there about Hatton and yeah. Bloom and Dove. I just wanted to sentence about but you can do it later. Yeah. No, no, I'll do it now actually because it's a, it's a useful way of arguing. You see, because uh, I mean, if you go onto the National College um, w website, there are three s s separate documents saying this is what coaching and mentoring are about, and all three are different. And therefore, what you say is, having analysed these alternative perspectives, this is what I believe. So, for example, in my own work on mentoring, I've said that mentoring is a long-term developmental and supportive uh, relationship designed to enable the learner to engage in effective learning. Something like that. Yeah? Support, developmental. Coaching, in my definition, is a specific intervention designed to bring about change. And so, for example, the literature on sports coaching is really helpful there. You know, some very, very useful models in sports coaching of saying the way to help somebody improve their performance by such a minute amount of time is absolutely fundamental. So the intervention with regard to a child who um, has real conceptual problems with a particular aspect of the curriculum, that's a coaching model. And then sometimes we can actually modify the coaching of the adult supporting the child into the child supporting other children. And there's quite a rich literature on that. But what it comes down to is Benjamin Bloom's research, which is usually referred to as the two sigma problem. Right, and two sigma, as you know, is a sigma is a standard deviation. And in Bloom's research, coaching had, was two standard deviations more effective than classroom teaching. And so the two sigma problem is how do we move away from generic teaching into coaching because it, it leads to two standard deviations improvement in, in the work. Yeah? Does that go somewhere towards responding? Have I just done a paragraph or two for you? Oh, good. <laughs> it's, it's good to be of service. Thank you. And I suppose the way to really check it out is that sometimes the literature review is really interesting and people are pulling in ideas and so on, and it, it comes to a rather limp and lame end. And what I would suggest to you is that on the basis of this review of the appropriate literature, then I would argue that coaching in, in, in pedagogy in schools has the following key characteristics. And, you, and, and I can find each of those characteristics identified in the literature where you've argued that it's uh, significant. And therefore, at the end of your chapter or section, you have given me a very explicit summary of what you found, which then goes on to inform how you gather your data in the next part of your dissertation. Happy with that? Is that okay for everybody? It sounds, sorry, it sounds again obvious, but actually it's not because sometimes I'm so glad to have got, got through the books that um, you know, let's just move on quickly. So coherent, logical and crucially saying sometimes this study has to be, you know, if you're doing something on change for example, the literature on, on change in education is vast but it all comes down to Michael Fullan in the end doesn't it? You know, and therefore, if you have done a study of change in, in terms of middle leadership in school and you don't mention Fullen, then my antennae will immediately start twitching and saying, not that you have to mention Michael Fullen, but rather, have you been able to give an, an accurate account of, of leading change without the use of Fullen? If you have, congratulations, it's probably worth publishing. But nevertheless, if you ignore one of the key sources, if you talk about pedagogy and don't refer to John Hattie, you might have problems. Is that fair? Yeah. 
you know, and that although it's contentious, the University of Durham stuff on the pupil premium, the Sutton Trust report, is one of your most powerful sources of empirical data about what makes a difference. And therefore it needs to be included if it's appropriate. Yeah, and so I mean, just to give you one example, sometimes you have to really go down the highways and the byways. Um, when it was announced that the provision of a free school meal would be for every child between five and seven, isn't it? That there was a lot of research done to justify that decision. And so in the, um, on the, the Deputy Prime Minister's website, you can find a piece of a small scale research project which actually says that providing every child between five and seven with a hot meal has had a greater impact on literacy than the Literacy Hour ever did. Isn't that great? And so therefore you say actually you know let's have structures about literacy, let's have interventions around literacy but there's a piece of research out there which actually says actually giving a child a hot meal does more to engage them yeah, than almost anything else we can think of. And that is, if, and if you miss that bit then saying you know, that we need this strategy and that strategy, whereas I would simply scroll across the page, dinner. <laughs> yeah, because that's where it really does seem to, um, one piece of evidence points in that direction. So the combination of coaching and dinner may well be uh, the, the breakthrough that, that your research demonstrates. Anything else on literature, ladies and gentlemen? Is your bibliography, I uh, beg your pardon, not your bibliography, your references, a small plea, it's not a bibliography, it's references. Do not include in your references anything that you have not quoted. It's not a, 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 an opportunity to show off. I'm aware of the existence of the following 32 books. Not interested. Here are the books I've actually cited, very important. Don't forget the internet, there's so much stuff there now and make sure that you, you cite it correctly, please. Yeah, because it's part of the academic courtesies, being able to say where this came from. So, you've asked your questions, one of which was about the conceptual framework, and your literature review has answered that question. Right, to give my voice a break for a moment. Are you, at the moment, confident that your literature review meets the criteria that we've just been discussing? <laughs> okay, I'll move on. Think of your, the current stage of development of your dissertation, please. Are you confident and comfortable that your writing is demonstrating that you understand the difference between methodological issues and methods? So the spotlight can go around the room now and when it stops on you, you stand up and say, here's my methodology and here are my methods. It's a very, very interesting and significant area. Essentially, the methodology is concerned with the epistemological status of your study. Now, I know that saying epistemological after four o'clock on a Monday afternoon is not helpful. But essentially, what it comes down to is what sort of knowledge is your study creating? That's the best way to put it. And you need to be aware that if you are carrying out a study based on teachers' journals of their responses to change in practice in their classrooms, that's a totally different form of knowledge to that developed by a survey of a large number, uh, of a big sample. Yeah, and you need to recognise essentially the status of the evidence that you are generating in order to support your main propositions and so on. So, in uh, the culture in which we work, by and large, we give greater deference to the, the, the quantitative and the so-called objective than we do to the qualitative and so-called subjective. But in fact, of course, if we're looking at certain aspects, for example, teachers' emotional responses to leadership. Let's have a big survey. Rubbish. What we, what we want are teachers' narratives of what their emotional responses actually are. That you know, their language is the most important thing of all. So, but as, and the thing is, it's all valid. There's some really powerful stuff been done in feminist research on this. The authenticity and the integrity of the personal voice 
is something that we should not diminish or marginalize because it's not objective. What we need to recognize though is that we can have different degrees of confidence. It's a bit like evidence in a court case, isn't it? Usually the DNA is seen as incontrovertible, but in fact we're now discovering that in fact DNA depends upon the integrity of the processes in order to be valid and that's what the defense counsel are now often doing is saying can we have an absolute guarantee that this dna sample has got integrity and then the circumstantial evidence at the, at the other end of the spectrum isn't there but actually sometimes circumstantial evidence is powerful corroboration so we don't dismiss it out of hand that's why courts still will allow third-party perspectives if it helps in order to support or deny a particular perspective you find most of the standard texts on research methods include at least one chapter on this whole notion of the, the objective, sorry, on the qualitative quantitative debate. And depending upon the way your study is um, formulated, you need to acknowledge that there are different types of knowledge and that your study falls within this particular category and that has the following implications for it. Yeah, that's got you quiet, hasn't it? Have you justified the ep epistemological status of your study, please? No. <laughs> Yeah. Methods are questionnaires. One That's study, right. Yeah. And the epistemological assumption is whether you're objectively looking or you're in it. Yes, right. That's great. Yeah. Yes, that's lovely. The, the, the interpretive uh, perspective. Yeah, most of these books, most of the study, uh, the, the textbooks, have got a, 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 a table showing left-hand side quantitative, right-hand side qualitative, positivistic, you know, etc., etc., etc. And all you've got to do is say, my study resides here because of the nature of the study I'm carrying out and I recognize that this has the following strengths and the areas which are potential. The crucial thing that I would really almost demand to see in a discussion of this would be first and foremost, I am confident for the following reasons that my research is valid and reliable and that there's been quite a lot of literature recently saying we need t t really to talk about trustworthiness. We can trust these findings because. Yeah? And if you want to understand the, the valid and reliable argument, think of your bathroom scales, please. Yeah? If they give you a broadly consistent reading over time, then your bathroom scales are reliable. If, however, when you go to the doctors, you find that the doctor's scales mean that you're, you're weighing rather more than your bathroom scales tell you, then your bathroom scales are not valid. Is good? Yes? Well, no, 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 you see, the doctors are authoritative. <laughs> the doctors are trustworthy, whereas yours are made for commercial purposes. Or alternatively, you believe the ones that have come closer to your own self-image. Yeah, absolutely. No, <laughs> exactly. But let's not go too far down that road. The notion is, is, do I as reader have confidence in what you're telling me? And by uh, identifying the methodological issues, the epistemological assumptions underpinning your research, by recognizing the strengths and, and comparative weaknesses of different approaches, so hopefully we build up a picture of what your research is actually. Does it have integrity? Yeah, and we're not looking for page after page of you know, postmodern perspectives or, uh, and so on. N simply saying, this research has adopted the following approach and that means that we're going to use the following methods. Yeah, and so for example, one of the areas which I think is really um, underused in education is the whole notion of using various types of ethnographic research. You're simply actually listening to people talking. 
You know, so the, the work of the great anthropologists is usually simply collecting people's perspectives. If you're looking at, you know, for example, looking at the school as a faith community, and, and I'll defer to my colleague immediately on this one, but actually you, you don't want to do a survey of how important is faith in our school life. You want people's voices, don't you, David? And that's when it becomes real. You know, you get teachers talking about the difference in working in a faith uh, um, community at uh, school. You get children to articulate what it means to be part of a faith community. That's far more appropriate than carrying out a survey, for heaven's sake. Now, if you have got lots of time on your hands, then you might want to survey half a dozen schools and see what the overall picture is. But the real integrity of your research will come down to interviews with uh, or journals which people have written from their own personal perspective. That's it. That's it. Absolutely. Yep. All those factors, the things that make it rich, and then you you end up with a lot of of rich data, i.e., quotations, and you deploy them in order to reinforce or challenge the key points made in your literature review. So sometimes quantitative is good, sometimes the qualitative is right, sometimes different types of qualitative are, are right. If you're talking about the teacher's career aspirations, for example, then what you want are people's subjective views of their own lives, yes? You don't want a massive survey, you want to understand individuals' <coughs> perspectives. You have to be careful though, there's a big debate going on in, in ethnographic studies over the past few years because you all heard of Margaret Mead coming of age in Samoa. And again, it's part of the politics of academia. An Australian anthropologist was really very suspicious of the way that this young American could go to Samoa and get this amazing data. And so he went to Samoa and said, do any of you and, um, um, senior ladies remember talking to a young American 50 years ago? Oh yes, she was a lovely girl, they said. She kept asking us about sex and we kept telling her things which we thought would amuse her. <laughs> and this led to the huge row of saying, actually, um, Margaret Mead was totally naive because what she didn't do was to corroborate the evidence that she got. That's why you need triangulation sometimes. Yeah. Okay. At the end of your your section on methodology and methods, you say, given the, qu the key research question, given what I'm seeking to establish, this is the optimum way forward. Yeah, because this is the best way that I can find to go forward. And then the question, oh yes, sorry, if your research involves colleagues and particularly involves children, then you must go through the full ethical, um, well, you have to do it automatically anyway. <laughs> but again, it needs to be included that this research, blah, 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 and therefore the, I, I, I confirm that I have followed the ethical um, um, requirements of the university. I, I, is there a pro forma? No? Yeah, we yeah. have been submitted at the proposal yeah. last year, but we, we encourage students to um, to, to either write a, se a section in terms of the ethical issues they've addressed and how they've addressed mm. them, or to actually <coughs> embed them in the text of the whole yeah, absolutely. To, to at least be up front and mm. say ethical issues permeate. Lovely. No That's subject. lovely. It needs a, a, a couple of pages of discussion, mm. and I think it's really the notion is, have I, can I demonstrate that I've secured informed consent? I think informed consent is really the key concept. I'd be very worried if I read a dissertation which involved um, um, interviewing colleagues and you know, getting children I into some kind of focus group if there wasn't informed consent. I, I would actually fail it, I think, because you know, it would be that serious. Yeah. Well, I mean, in one university I worked, the, um, the ethics form, uh, because they, always had, they haven't always been about, you know, it's, it's comparatively recent, it's become standard, but the ethics form started with, does this research involve experimentation upon animals? And, and one student wrote, no, j just children. <laughs> Far easier, you know, much easier. Um, yeah. 
Really interesting that, um, I don't know. Um, I think you've got to actually acknowledge the fact that there are public definitions of vulnerability, aren't there? Yeah. And that's the area to go down, is to say that the, the official literature, the government policy, identifies vulnerability as a significant factor in, in closing the gap. And that our current definitions of vulnerability are very limited but, for example, the documentation on the pupil premium indicates the following categories quite explicitly. And in that way, you identify those particular areas. But you do recognise that this is sensitive and subjective interpretations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It depends upon the culture of the school. Some schools are very open about it. No, well, I didn't tell them, but it, I kind of had then wrote about why I didn't tell them, but I still didn't feel quite right about it. No, I know what you mean, yeah. No, the, the notion is that as long as they are not the unwitting subjects of your research, that's okay. As long as they've been actively engaged in a process which they understand, then you're fine. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, just going back to the positive All right. If you're presenting to the senior management team and you're wanting money, um, <laughs> you want more qualitative, <coughs> The graphic. Because yeah. if you want money off them, they want to see some numbers. Would you disagree with that? Um, it depends how literate the senior management team is. <laughs> if they've done the pro followed this program, you see, or they're currently within a group, then I think that would. Really if you have an evidence-based culture in school, which of course all schools should have, shouldn't they, then essentially any kind of argument which is based upon valid and reliable data should be given respect, in my view. But because, you see, we do have this artificial deference to the quantitative yeah. and it, it's, it, it can be nonsense. You know, I mean, the, the, the case one, which is slightly unsatisfactory as an example, but it makes the point, is the report during the Second World War that in one naval um, station, 50% of the wrens were, were pregnant. And there were two wrens, and one of whom was married. <laughs> and so what's the issue? Yeah? Be very careful with the quantitative, yeah. Data in order to springboard the questions you will ask. Absolutely. The interpretations yeah. you will be seeking. So yeah. it's not quite as clear. Oh no, it's never, never one or the other. Absolutely right. Because it depends on where you are going to get your credibility for your investigation from. And um, for example, there's an American researcher, um, I don't, I'm not sure, I think she's retired now, called Susan Rosenholtz. And she is just magical in her balancing of the quantitative and the qualitative. And the quantitative provides the, the focus that allows you to draw the right questions out. That's the, that's the issue. But it depends upon the sort of research you're doing. Um, we're halfway down. The analysis of your data, this again is probably the second most significant area. Please, 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 please do not just describe your data. Explain your data. Tell me what it means. Link it back into the literature. Tell me, you do not assume that I will pick up all the points that you're making. Please, please, please engage with your data. It's not about nice, neat Gantt charts or anything else. It's all about your interpretation, your explanation. And crucially, if I may use the word, your codification. In other words, what are the themes that emerge? How can I prioritise them? Yeah. And that then allows you to go into the final stages, which are the notion of the recommendations. And again, it's the internal logic of your study, ladies and gentlemen, that is so important. That A leads to B leads to C. By the way, we ignored E and F, but we're now back to G. Yeah, and so you, you must have an internal logic that follows through so that your, your, your conclusions and your recommendations are valid and appropriate and clearly derived from the evidence. I always welcome somebody saying, in, in the course of doing this research, one of the key conclusions I've reached is that I now understand this better than I did. That's good to see. 
that I've learned about the, 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 you know, the issues around school-based research. In my role, I think I can adapt the, um, the, the school-based approach, you know, sorry, this classroom-based approach. You know, just tell us what you've learned about yourself as a researcher, about your work as a professional. And then, you know, will it make a difference? And hopefully, going back to this notion of the academic, the scholarly, and the professional, if your research is professional, then hopefully it will make a difference in some way. And, and, and tell us about that as well, please. <coughs> OK. Five minutes. Any comments, questions, thoughts? Is it in that section where you have problems that you have? Yes. Well, I, I, again, thank you again. I think the problems crop up right the way through. If, so, for example, um, it has proved impossible to get hold of a copy of XYZ by uh, um, ABC. And therefore, I know that my research is compromised because this quotation that I've used, which is quoted by somebody else, I can't verify. And therefore, you know, there's an issue for me. Um, alternatively, that um, halfway through my data collection, the the leadership team changed their mind and said I could only work you know, with a smaller um, sample size. And so again, you comment on those issues. It's a, it's a bit like the iterative process with your research questions, so there's a similar process with, as you go through. It's really a, a running commentary on doing the, you know, being a researcher is very... It, it is as opposed to a section. That's right. I think so. My own view is that, that I welcome that because research is a process, not a series of events. Yeah? Thank you for that again. Learning through the research process is simply, you know, it's essentially you being metacognitive about yourself as a researcher and as a professional. And therefore, for example, having done this research, I now recognise that part of effective leadership in schools needs to come down to being evidence-based and that sort of conclusion. But it's really all the literature there is on metacognition in terms of effective learning applies to um, reflecting on your role as a researcher. What have you learnt about yourself as a professional? Um, what, how would you do this again in the future? Those sorts of questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John, and thank you for all your contributions. Yeah. I think um, you'd want to show your appreciation for John in terms of... Very good.